Hello and welcome to Prism of the Past, a weekly series about historical events, people, and situations from the fascinating to the forgotten. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about Nara Dreamland, also known as just Dreamland. This theme park was essentially a sort of a knockoff of Disney World that ultimately closed and then became very popular with urban explorers. I've always loved the look of this place and it honestly reminds me of what you'd see in the like abandoned porn subreddit, which is a subreddit for interesting pictures of abandoned places. It's really quite interesting and it actually has been posted there before. We're also going to briefly touch upon their sister park, Yokohama Dreamland, which was operated and closed around the same time too. So let's get into it. What was Nara Dreamland? Well, it all started with a man named Kunizo Matsuo, and there's not a ton of information out there about him, but it's said that he was born in 1899 and originally worked as a kabuki actor. Kabuki is a traditional Japanese drama with singing and dancing in a highly stylized manner. According to Britannica, a rich blend of music, dance, mime, and spectacular staging and costuming, it has been a major theatrical form in Japan for four centuries. The term kabuki originally suggested the unorthodox and shocking character of this art form. In modern Japanese, the word is written with three characters, ka signifying song, bu, dance, and ki, skill. Kunizo Matsuo, I think it's safe to say, had an appreciation for the arts. According to one source, he even founded his own company, the Matsuo Entertainment Company. After World War II, industry in Japan was booming and American culture became extremely popular in Japan. Representing MEC, Matsuo visited the newly opened Disneyland in Anaheim and he basically fell in love with the place. Matsuo wanted to meet with Walt Disney himself and began making plans to build a similar park in Nara, Japan's old capital, and license the design of the characters from Disney. It's said that Matsuo began working with WED Enterprises, the subsidiary of Disney behind construction of Disneyland and the precursor for what became known as Walt Disney Imagineering. The construction began under the name Japanese Dream Sightseeing Company. Other sources say that the parent company was called Japan Dream Tourism, and we'll touch on them more in just a little bit. It's said that as the building progressed and the park was nearing completion, Matsuo and Disney began running into issues with licensing fees. Rather than abandon the project entirely, the parent company paid WED for the help they received building the park up to that point, but began creating their own branding and characters and those characters became known as Ranchen and Dorchan, two children characters dressed as British soldiers, and they became the park's mascots. They even had characters such as Snoozing Model, like a ripoff Sleeping Beauty, and Michael Mouse, an obvious Mickey ripoff, strolling down their main street. One wooden roller coaster took clear inspiration from the cyclone at Coney Island. One video from the channel Defunct Land on YouTube goes into details about each ride that they featured from the teacup rides to the Wild West Railroad, a carousel, a haunted maze, a skyway and turtle boats inspired by phantom boats and the motor boats cruise and Disney's canal boats. Nara Dreamland also had an attraction called Miracle House where guests would enter a show building, board a pirate ship and see various scenes from around the world, their version of the Peter Pan attraction. It makes sense that because Disney literally helped build the park and it was supposed to be a Disney park that the rides would end up similar. So I can't really fault them for that one. They opened on July 1st, 1961, unleashing the Disney knockoff upon the world. And remarkably, it was a massive success with about 1.6 million guests per year at its peak. They opened more roller coasters in the 70s, the flying saucers that sound like bumper cars except UFOs, an antique car attraction, a log flume ride, and the Jungle Cruise. They had Ancestorland similar to Disney's Frontierland, except featuring older Japanese culture, which was later demolished to make room for a water park. Even though this park may not have had the genuine Disney characters, this park was absolutely blooming. One blog describes it as such. The signs in the abandoned Nara Dreamland indicate that it was a pay-as-you-go amusement park, as was Disneyland when it opened in 1955, which means that you had to pay a low entrance fee and then additionally for every single ride. So basically it was up to you how much you spent there. Sadly, I never paid much attention to the prices. So let me have a look at some photos and see what I can come up with. 
Parking was 200 yen for bikes, 1200 yen for cars, and 2000 yen for buses. Bobsleigh, the steel roller coaster modeled after Disney's Matterhorn bobsleds was 600 yen and a haunted witch cave put a hole in 300 yen in your pocket. As for food, a beer was 500 yen, Chuhai was 400 yen, takoyaki was 300 yen, yakisoba was 400 yen, and the family barbecue was 3,200 yen. I don't know how much the entrance fee was, but if you get caught by security now, it costs you a whopping 100,000 yen. Because the park was doing so remarkably well, proving that Japan was ripe for theme parks, they opened up a sister park, Yokohama Dreamland. So let's briefly step away from Nara for a moment and talk about them as well. Yokohama Dreamland opened just three years after Nara did in 1964. My sources have called the parent company Japan Dream Tourism here, so that's why it seems to be some name confusion in general. But from what I can tell, in 1964, when Yokohama opened, Japan Dream Tourism and Dream Transportation Company were separated to form this park. Anyway, Yokohama opened. There's some rare photos of the place published on the Tokyo Weekender, and there's graphs online of all the rides they had and when they opened. They had a giant slide called Daddy Long Legs, a miniature railway called the Otagi Train, and the Wonder Wheel, Wave Swinger, Top Spin, like you name it, they had it. And they also had the same little British soldier mascots as Nara, and the old videos of the place definitely show a very strong American influence as well. From the arcade games to the very Disney-esque vibe, you kind of get the picture of what it was supposed to be. However, it wasn't long before Nara's sister park began having issues. On May 2nd, 1966, the Yokohama Dreamland monorail opened, yet on September 4th, 1967, it closed. They considered reopening it in 1971, but that was never meant to be. This had been a massive hit for the park. So for cracks to appear in the monorail beam so soon and for the attraction to close after just a year of operation, it didn't really bode well for the park and guests took notice. Plus this monorail had been open because the park itself wasn't exactly very close to any nearby stations. So without the monorail, this park was doomed. And even worse yet, Disney was coming to Japan. Tokyo Disneyland arrived on April 15th, 1983. This ultimately is what spelled the death of Matsuo's dreamlands. The Oriental Land Company had done what Matsuo had failed to do in licensing the characters. So now theme park visitors could not only visit Disneyland, but the real genuine thing. Guess what the US has exported to Japan? A little bit of Americana, that's what. Defunctland describes how the theme park was slowly falling apart and quote, Tokyo Disneyland came with the immersive theming and creative properties that blew Nara out of the water. The knockoff was hit hard by Disneyland's opening and guests sank to 1 million visitors per year. The park suffered from lower budgets and poorer upkeep and by the mid nineties, the park was littered with trash, rides were standing but not operating and stray animals could be found wandering the property. It only seemed like a matter of time before Nara closed. Worse yet, the man that created Naro, Matsuo himself, passed away and unfortunately left an absolute mess behind him. Although I'm getting just a bit off track here, I find what happened after Matsuo passed away both interesting and a bit heartbreaking. So let's briefly discuss what happened there. According to my source, Meguro Gajoen is a wedding hall, hotel, and office building complex located 250 meters west of Meguro Station in Tokyo. The historic Haikuden Kaiden, the banquet rooms inside, was the setting in Osamu Daisy's Kaijitsu novel in 1944, and was also the inspiration for the bathhouse in Spirited Away in 2001. A section of the land was once the site of the Gajoen Kenko Hotel. The hotel was operated by kabuki actor and businessman Matsuo in affiliation with Matsuo's company, Nihon Dream Kenko. After Matsuo's death, his widow and company executives fought over management rights, which led to the hotel cutting ties from Nihon Dream. The hotel was later caught up in the Itomen scandal in 1990. As a result, the hotel filed for bankruptcy in 1997 and the building was demolished. This Itomen scandal was massive at the time, by the way. Police and prosecutors staged dozens of raids on Itomen and company, an Osaka-based textile trader that was said to have purchased more than $500 million worth of paintings by masters like Picasso. New York Times, while this was happening, reported the following. 
Now, attention has turned to a little notice corner of that market in which large Japanese corporations apparently bought paintings, not to invest in fine art, but to use the purchases either to conceal transfers of million dollars in cash or to evade taxes. In an economy that is heavily taxed and hemmed in by regulation, experts say, dealings in multi-million dollar paintings provide a handy dodge. It was well known that art has commonly been used to hide money or secretly move it into the past few years, commented Nobuo Ebi, the chief curator at Bridgestone Museum of Art in Tokyo, who said he had heard of many such cases. To date, no wrongdoing has been proved, nor have there been any indictments. Still, the art world has been riveted by the tales of mysterious art capers that have unfolded in the Japanese press. To have Matsuo's name attached to this in any way probably was not a great look. I will say that when I was researching this, I came across a tweet that said that although there's been less interest in Kunizo Matsuo overseas, he remained well-known in Japan. This tweet also claims that Osaka Kabukisa under his management had a building there and that department store caught fire and that that fire killed 118 people back in 1972. However, I do wanna point out that this is just a tweet. Not that the incident wasn't real because the incident did in fact happen. I just don't wanna connect the dots that may or may not be there. That said, there was absolutely enough proof for me to mention the Ito Men scandal that took place in affiliation with his company. Apparently, by the time all of this ended in 2002, those involved faced heavy fines and a few years in prison. Yet, despite this company having a connection to some shady activities, Kunizo Matsuo did some fantastic work in education as well. He founded the Matsuo Arts Foundation, the Matsuo Education Association, and he even was a consul for Mexico. I wasn't able to find details on this either, but as I dug further into Matsuo's past, I did find one 1968 newspaper clipping that mentioned some legal trouble he may have been in, and it read, Impresorio Kunisio Matsuo or Dream Entertainment Osaka alleged the theater restaurant Al de Chapinese Cultural and Trade Center was not built to specifications and has abandoned plans to occupy the $2 million facility. National Bramers Incorporated, the developers, in revealing this turn of events last week completely denied the allegation. Litigation against Dream ended last June 13 with the developers accorded a new judgment for nearly $430,000. Wells Fargo Bank, which provided the loan for construction, is also suing Matsuo and his firm. Obviously, even though I'm pretty damn confident this is the same guy, because all of this happened so long ago and in another country, this information isn't all that readily available. I wasn't able to find this lawsuit specifically or even what exactly this lawsuit was even about. All that I do know is that it seems that not all of Matsuo's other business-related ventures were going all that smoothly before he passed away. Unfortunately, not long after he died, the Parks died along with him. When Tokyo Disney arrived, the numbers dwindled. MEC, Matsuo's company, including Nara Dreamland, was bought by a supermarket chain in 1993. And this company didn't make any significant investment into the park though, seemingly letting it collapse. In 2001, when Universal Studios Japan opened up just 40 kilometers away, attracting 11 million guests in its first year, and Tokyo Disney Sea turned Tokyo Disneyland into a two-par resort, well, Nara just couldn't compete anymore. It fell into an extreme state of disrepair and Yokohama was no better off. The park closed in 2002 and the monorail was dismantled in 2003. However, the space wasn't completely wasted. The existing hotel was converted into classrooms and a library. The Yokohama College of Pharmacy was established on the location in 2006 too. As for Nara Dreamland, it remained abandoned for quite some time, attracting a ton of urban explorers. There was security around the park, but apparently out of the dozens of times one of these explorers visited, they were only spotted twice and caught once. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't wanna mess with security or anything, and I'm sure it's probably not super safe to go inside, but some of these photos, including a video of the parks in its abandoned state are just so damn cool. There's something so incredibly captivating about seeing an old knockoff Disneyland stuck in time, overgrown and abandoned. Unlike many other theme parks, the rides were never actually sold, so it truly was frozen in time, appearing exactly as it had on the day of closing. Well, except for some of the vandals in the area. As the abandoned Kansai blog answers the question, is there vandalism? Sadly, yes, lots of it. When I explored Nara Dreamland for the first time in December of 2009, there were barely any signs of vandalism. 
Almost two years later, there are graffiti at the former pachinko parlor at the Eastern parking lot. The parking's garage staircase is completely sealed now and the hotel is boarded up again. Inside the park, you can see how people smash the control station of the merry-go-round. The fire extinguisher is still on top of the broken glass. The Main Street USA clone with all the souvenir shops has barely any undamaged windows and several doors were kicked in. It's actually pretty sad how fast the place goes down the drain, especially since the graffiti people took over and not the good ones. However, as early as the 2010s, things changed. In 2011, Nara Dreamland went up for sale, but there were absolutely no bids. One source stated, the foreclosed Nara Dreamland Amusement Park in Nara City failed to attract a single bid when it was put up for public auction on November 11th. The 297,000 square meter site was listed for sale with a minimum price of 730 million yen or 6.3 million USD. Although 10 inquiries were received, no bids were made. With a minimum price of around 2,400 yen per square meter, this might seem like an exceptional bargain when compared to the surrounding area, but the park is dotted with a number of overgrown and unsafe structures and rides, which would require several hundred million yen to remove. The land is also subject to a number of strict building regulations that make redevelopment a difficult task. The land falls in an urbanization control area and current uses only permit welfare, sports, museum, zoo, or school facilities. Approval from the prefectural governor is required before construction. The city took over the property in 2013 after the former owner fell behind in property taxes to the tune of 650 million yen. It's sad to see this theme park come to an end and such a sad end at that. But of course, I understand the mindset all the same of wanting to reuse and repurpose that land into something else. As cool as it was that an abandoned park had this cool and niche cult following online, it's not as if vandals or explorers breaking in was bringing any money to the property whatsoever. Around 2014, those plans to repurpose the park began to come to fruition. One 2014 source reads, the 32 hectare park is currently under the management of a company called Dreamland. They owe approximately 650 million yen in taxes. The city had plans to purchase the site from Dreamland and build a crematorium, but local residents were opposed to the idea. Dreamland claimed that the city had also discussed a reduction on their fixed asset taxes. Then this same website's 2015 article states, Nara Dreamland, the long since closed amusement park modeled after California's Disneyland was purchased by an Osaka based real estate company earlier this month for 730 million yen. The buyer, SK Housing, was the only bidder at the public auction. It is unclear what the new owner plans to do out the site. The 297,000 square meter site includes 75 buildings consisting old and abandoned theme park rides and an old hotel, all of which will cost several hundred million yen to demolish. Strict zoning regulations limit potential uses for the site to welfare facilities, libraries, sporting grounds, museums, zoos, or schools, while residential, commercial, retail, or hotel investments are prohibited. Building heights are also limited to 10 meters. The property was sold off by Nara City, who had foreclosed on the site after the previous owner fell behind in property taxes to the tune of 650 million yen. The city's first offered the property for sale in 2013, but the auction failed to attract any bids. This time, SK Housing were the successful buyer after offering the minimum bid of 730 million yen, which had been set by the city. Not long after being sold in 2017, Nara Dreamland was demolished to make way for housing. There's some pretty interesting stories online of people's experiences there. Some say that the cops were pretty lenient when people trespassed, and there's some beautiful and eerie photos of Nara at night. Some urban explorers have also documented the demolition of Nara and shown the ruins of their once famous roller coasters. Hell, there's even a few urban legends and conspiracy theories out there about it as well. One of them being that the whole park was apparently created by Disney just to see if the park would be popular enough to justify the construction of an official Disneyland there. This post continues and reads, as if that wouldn't be ridiculous enough, somebody claimed that the official new mascots were not poor students in poorly tailored costumes, but in fact robots. And that series six unit 22 was so special that they didn't turn it off, but let it roam freely in the park after it closed in 2006, defending a solar power station and giving everyone who tries to deactivate him an electric shock. But that's not all. Some people actually seem to believe that the Japanese military asked Disney if they should take out mascot 6-22, but they declined as the thing was showing interesting program adaptations. 
seriously, what the heck? The whole story is so ridiculous, I won't even spend time to point out all the things that are wrong with it. Yes, I know, both the origin and the end of Nara Dreamland are somewhat in the dark, but come on people, that's a bit much, don't you think? And I'm kind of inclined to believe this blogger that I just don't believe there's a killer robot named Mascot 6-22, but at least it's fun and relatively harmless to think about, I guess. I mean, it's certainly not all that bad when you think about some of the more intense conspiracy theories we've seen in these previous episodes. All in all though, I can really see why Nara Dreamland became so famous and abandoned Disney knockoff, overgrown and frozen in time. It absolutely sounds like somewhere I would have loved to explore with a damn good camera. Although I do admit, I don't think I would have been brave enough to climb on any of the rickety old roller coaster structures. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Prism of the Past. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following and subscribing so that you can stay up to date with all the latest episodes. And if you want to connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to go to my Linktree link. You're gonna find links to like my Twitter, Instagram, Discord server, Twitch, any projects I'm involved with, you name it, it's gonna be there. So thank you all so much for making it to another episode. I love you and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.